thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, as the song said, we're not going to take it anymore. Uh, I'm Regina Clemente. I'm the senior advisor at MVP. I've done organizing work for about the last two decades, um, including around reproductive justice and freedom. And tonight I am coming to you from my home in Boise, Idaho, one of the seven states that has implemented a near total abortion ban with no exceptions yeah. for the pregnant patient's health. In fact, Idaho law will be decided this week by the U.S. Supreme Court case, Moyle versus the U.S., where the court will decide whether states can ignore a federal law, which requires most hospitals to provide emergency care to patients who need it, including abortions. And just today, a leaked court document seems to affirm that doctors in Idaho will likely be allowed to perform emergency abortions again in Idaho, but we've yet to see the final decision. We're not sure, and this will not fix issues in other states. And so... I come to you tonight, not just as someone who's worked on this issue a lot, but as someone who knows doctors in my community who have to ask themselves questions like, if this patient's pregnancy has a complication, at what point is it serious enough to be life-threatening and can I provide care? Because if it's deemed not life-threatening enough by the state, the doctor is personally getting up to five years in prison, having their license revoked and being sued. And these kinds of laws have unsurprisingly led to significant doctor and nurses shortages in places like Idaho and throughout the country where there are full bans in states. Two hospitals here in Idaho have actually already closed their labor and delivery units entirely, making rural access here worse than it's ever been before. And pregnant people and their families don't know if they can get care locally or if they'll need to be airlifted across state lines in the midst of a pregnancy related emergency. So we all know it's pretty dire and that Idaho is far from alone which is why we're here tonight to join forces and give you guys insight into the most impactful ways you can be supporting organizing around abortion access this year in ways that build for a much less dystopian future. For those of you new to MVP, welcome. Thanks so much for joining tonight. We are a one-stop shop for strategically investing in local organizing that wins elections and transforms policy. We do the research on groups so you don't necessarily have to. And so you can maximize your impact by streamlining your giving. That said, we also always encourage you to give directly to local groups on the ground, which you'll have the opportunity to do here tonight. Um, and while there are numerous amazing partner national organizations focused on reproductive freedoms, um, who we work with side by side, side, tonight we really aim to give you a look into some of the specific local work being done on the ground by multiracial led, BIPOC led, grassroots organizations each focused on one or more of these three goals. One, winning a federal trifecta to abolish the filibuster and codify the right to an abortion at the federal level, leveraging ballot measures for state abortion rights and building state power in all three branches of state gov government, governors, state chambers, and state Supreme Courts. Um, but before we turn to the heart of the program, a few logistics. Um, the slides in the recording of this will be uh, emailed out in the next one to two days. Um, we have the chat, which you can use for questions, um, and we'll also be posting information there for you to see. Um, and we'll end promptly at one hour, but staff will stay on for an additional 15 minutes or so for any additional questions or if you want to learn how to get more involved. So now I have the pleasure of turning it to one of our MVP Healthcare Leaders for Democracy volunteers. Lillian Shirley, who's a mom, a grandmom, and a nurse who's worked in public health leadership at the state, city, and county public health executive levels for close to 40 years, and whose passion for reproductive justice stems from early pre-row experiences and the horror of the attacks we're seeing now. Lillian, thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Regina, and thank you all for being here tonight and joining our community of healthcare and public health leaders working to protect our patients and the health of our communities in this coming election. Healthcare Leaders has been working since June of 22, raising money for groups on the ground, in the front lines of this fight. We are all volunteers. We're a group of parents, doctors, hospital administrators, nurses, public health professionals, and, and community health workers. But we realize now that how dire things are and how generous folks like you who care so much about these issues are, that we've just set our goal much higher. Tonight, we hope to raise at least another $200,000 to add to the $450,000 we've already raised for the strategies and groups you'll hear from tonight. For more information on joining Healthcare Leaders for Democracy, 
see the information in the chat. We'll be using the chat to field your questions and also to receive your feedback as well. That's also very important to us. Thank you again for joining us tonight. And I'm gonna turn it back to Regina. Thanks, Lillian. And thank you to all of our fabulous Healthcare for Democracy volunteers who have been so committed to this work and who turned out so many of you to get involved tonight. I now turn it over to Sarah Chasen Warner, our MVP Senior State Strategy Director, who's gonna give you an overview of the national landscape and some good things. Hi everyone, so glad to be with this group again. Um, uh, for those of you who I haven't met before, my work in organizing started in healthcare 18 years ago. My very first organizing job was to ensure the passage of a bill in New Hampshire that would ban smoking from bars and restaurants. That was 18 years ago. Um, I've also, when I was at um, a national organizing entity, uh, my job was to coordinate the field work around ensuring that Trump did not um, uh, repeal the Affordable Care Act. And so I feel very much at home with, with uh, uh, health care leaders. So thanks so much for having me. Um, here, I'm going to give a quick overview of the MVP program before we hand it over to um, Florida, Montana, and Arizona. Um, Julie, could I have the next slide, please? The next so as we think about the victory since Dobbs, we're just going to highlight a couple of them um, from MVP. You know, first, New Virginia Majority and CASA really galvanized voters around reproductive rights um, and, you know, were able to hold the state Senate and flip the House of Delegates and the saving the abortion rights in the only current Southern safe haven, the only current Southern safe haven for abortion rights. If you're not familiar with abortion rights in Virginia, abortion is legal until 26 weeks and then some stipulations after that. Next, thank you. In Pennsylvania last year, dozens of our partners helped to hold a 5-2 Democratic majority on the state Supreme Court. You heard Regina mentioned a bit about the work that we're doing on state Supreme Courts. Worked on it last year, we're doing more on this year, and I'll focus more on that a little bit later. But we targeted young adults, voters of color and women who supported abortion rights and really leveraged the reproductive rights to boost the winning progressive candidate. We were really proud of that work. Moving on to Ohio, similarly, um, our partners in Ohio helped to pass, pass a ballot measure to enshrine abortion rights in the state constitution. This was also a really important stepping stone, not only from a policy and electoral perspective, but into 2024, where we are working to reelect Senator Sherrod Brown. And then in Wisconsin, MVP partners helped to elect um, a Democrat to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, flipping the body's ide ideological majority. They focused really heavily on the issue of, more, of abortion to, feel, to the field in that really important win. And then the last one that I'll mention as well uh, is Kansas. MVP supported partners defeated Amendment 2, which if passed, it would have removed Kansas' constitutional right to abortion. These are just a couple of um, highlights from the last two years. And you can see these are not just highlights from blue states. These are highlights from blue states, from red states, from purple states, and more. And so as we think about the work going into 2024, a critical part of our work to advance abortion rights and care and to strengthen the electoral support is by winning at the federal level. We're heavily focused on nine battleground states. We call them the big nine here at MVP, um, where the fate of the U.S. Senate and the presidency will likely lie. In addition to that, we're also looking, watching the Maryland race as well. Some of you might be familiar with the Maryland race with the former very popular governor who was engaged in the U.S. Senate race on the Republican side. We're definitely watching that. Um, so clearly, you know, winning um, these are cr really critical for legislative purposes, but we also need and want to hold power, particularly in the presidency in the U.S. Senate, to claw back our Supreme Court. Within this assessment as well is also a, a deep investment in U.S. House races. Um, so MVP is focused on about 24 toss-up seats. Doesn't mean that we're not watching those lean Ds and lean R seats, because we certainly are. We're really focusing in on those 24 toss-up seats. And some are held by Democrats, some are held by Republicans, and others are open seats um, in order for us to gain the majority. And some of these seats are nested in the big nine, but many aren't. Concentrations in New York and California are, of course, rising to the top. There are also races in New Mexico, Colorado, Washington, and more, once again demonstrating the importance of all the many states that we are in, not just the big nine. 
So to make these gains, you know, our partners are testing and refining their targeting messaging, and they're using data from the voter file and modeling to predict support for abortion rights. They're educating and engaging voters about the candidate stances on this issue and what the world could look like under Democrat or Republican federal control. And then they're mobilizing these voters to vote up and down the ballot in November. Here's a couple of um, uh, important tidbits as we think about that mobilization for November. We know that voters who say abortion is the most important issue in 2024 are disproportionately made up of black voters, democratic voters, women voters, and the youngest voting bloc, voters who are ages 18 to 29. We also know that two thirds of the public, including majorities of Democrats and independents, support a law guaranteeing a federal right to abortion. And believe it or not, about two thirds of the public hadn't heard anything about the recent Supreme Court decision that could have impacted medication abortion that is luckily being preserved for now. And many voters are at least somewhat confused by the abortion laws in their state currently. So it's just a bit about the federal work, but it's not all about the federal. Um, we're also advancing state power, and that's a pretty critical part of our work as well. One does not exist without the other. So to advance this issue and build electoral power, we're focusing our efforts in several state-based ways as well. We're including leveraging ballot, ballot, excuse me, ballot measures, <laughs> uh, winning Supreme Court races or continuing to win since we've been winning, and breaking up Republican trifectas with a focus on our priority states. So I'll spend just a little bit of time talking about the Supreme Court races we're actively engaged on as well. You heard me talk a little earlier about the work that we did last year in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Next up this year is Montana and Ohio. And we've seen all of the power that the court wields on this issue. And we're mobilizing voters around these races too. And for many voters, it might be their first time actually engaging in a race like this. In state legislatures as well, uh, thank you, next slide. Uh, we're advancing abortion narratives and defining candidates based heavily on their stances on abortion. In the, in the state that I reside, New Hampshire, where we have one of the few opportunities across the country to break up a Republican trifecta this year, we're drawing really clear distinctions across, um, across the state between the Republican and the Democratic candidates on the issue, focusing heavily on mobilizing young adults and persuading swing voters. And to the South, our North Carolina partners are similarly educating and mobilizing voters in this issue to win the governor's seat and, of course, excuse me, strengthen that role by ending the super majority. So I hope that this has given you a bit of a taste of the work that we're supporting with the contributions and the efforts of volunteers of donors like you. I'm now going to hand this over to Regina to frame up our discussions with the three states, Arizona, Florida, and Montana. So I'll hand that over to you, Regina. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks, everyone. Yeah, let's do some deep dives into the reason uh, MVP exists, our local partners, and the work they're doing on the ground. We are going to start with Arizona, which has no shortage of races and measures they're going to win this year. Um, they are looking at presidential races, Senate races, House races, uh, ballot measures, and they're, they're both state chambers. And so I am going to turn it over to Laura Dent, who was born and raised in the Phoenix Valley um, and has served as the executive director in the past of Chispa, Arizona, as well as has been the coalition director of Activate 48, which is a network of movement building orgs leading voter engagement work across the state. So she's a longtime friend of MVPs, and she now serves as the political director of Arizona for Abortion Access, which is the statewide ballot measure there. Laura, welcome. Much, Regina. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yes, as Regina described, my name is um, Laura Dent. I go by Laura or Laura. I am the political director for Arizona for Abortion Access. We are a citizens initiative that is working to qualify in July and win in November a constitutional amendment to protect our right to abortion access in the state of Arizona. Um, but I really do come from a grassroots organizing and a movement building and a power building background, which is where I've spent the last several years. So I wanna give a major shout out to Movement Voter PAC and all of the folks supporting this effort because we've really seen the trajectory of our state transition over the last decade plus from, you might recall our history of SB 1070, which is Arizona Show Me Your Papers Law to Sheriff Joe and America's Toughest Sheriff 
some of the most hostile conditions that our conservative lawmakers engendered in the state really ignited a movement and sparked the leadership of so many compelling organizations that Movement Voter PAC has supported, but those organizations have expanded the electorate, done power building and organizing work across the state, and really tilled the soil to allow us to be in the position that we're in today, which is really exciting. So um, I'll go ahead and move to the next slide and talk a little bit about um, that. Um, thank you. So in terms of where we have been, this is just a little bit of a level setting around where we're at in the state. You're, I'm sure, aware of the federal importance of Arizona. We have a national presidential contest. We have a Senate race. The path to winning back the House majority moves through districts one and six in Arizona, but our state level landscape has evolved in an incredible way over the past several years. No, like much thanks to the power building and organizing work happening in Arizona. So just to walk you through some of what has brought us to where we are today. In 2020, we had our top of ticket wins. In 2022, we actually won state administrative contests, including a Democratic governor, Katie Hobbs, which we hadn't seen a Democratic governor in many, many years. A Democratic Attorney General, Chris Mays, who's one of our strongest champions on reproductive rights, freedoms, and pro-democracy initiatives, she won her race by 270 votes. So I bring that race up often because it underscores how every door knock, every phone call, every conversation, every investment has been part of what has woven the web to bring us to where we are today. Um, and then, of course, this year we have all of those amazing federal races. But at the state level, we are one seat away from parity in either legislative chamber, so two seats away from a majority. And we have not held a governing majority in Arizona for more than 50 years. So this is a wind ball change shift for our state. And um, it's really the landscape with which we're having the conversation around abortion rights right now. Um, you all may have heard in April, our state Supreme Court passed a, um, or allowed to, to come into law a territorial era abortion ban, a total abortion ban, one of the most regressive in the nation. It was a real gut punch to all of us. We knew that it was a potential reality, but um, that ban woke a lot of people up in the state around the fact that we are not holding our reproductive rights in our hands. Politicians and judges are holding those rights and we have to take that power back. The legislature actually repealed that ban, seeing the writing on the wall, seeing that Arizonans are not in step with um, that type of regressive attitude around our reproductive care. And so we are currently at another ban that has uh, no exceptions for um, health uh, and welfare after 15 weeks and is an extreme ban that we need to overturn nonetheless. So that's brought us to a moment of clarity around needing a constitutional amendment and organizing around that now. Um, next slide, please. So who is uh, Arizona for Abortion Access? We have an incredible coalition of leaders, including Planned Parenthood, uh, Advocates of Arizona, Reproductive Freedom for All, the ACLU of Arizona, Arizona List, Healthcare Rising, and Living United for Change in Arizona Lucha. Many of you all might be familiar with Lucha's amazing organizing work. They helped make the minimum wage uh, increase in Arizona possible years ago and have done incredible and compelling organizing, particularly among the Latino community for many years. So we're thrilled to have them on our team and to be continuing to kind of grow this coalition and this effort. Um, this coalition came together after the Dobbs leak uh, two years ago, which was a watershed moment for many of us. It's the, It was the um, impetus for me to share my own abortion story. Um, I know a lot of people really... Um, yeah, it, it was a it was a hard moment for all of us. And so um, this coalition came together, worked through a lot of challenges around language, around how we wanted to approach this effort, conversations with community, and um, came to language that will essentially restore the protections that we benefited from under Roe and um, take some of those protections even one step further. And so very proud of the coalition for working through a lot of difficult conversations and difficult constraints around our initiative process in Arizona um, to make that possible. Our legislature knows that citizens' initiatives are the way that we make progress in the state, and they've made it really difficult to make that happen. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of progress on the campaign, I am so excited to report that on Wednesday of next week, July 3rd at 8 a.m., we will be submitting 
800,000 signatures of Arizona voters. This is the largest volunteer signature gathering effort in the history of the state. We need 390,000 signatures to qualify for a constitutional amendment, and we have more than doubled that. Right after this briefing, I am running to our volunteer appreciation party to celebrate the thousands of leaders that have been doing incredible work organizing around this effort. So this is really a watershed moment for our state. Um, and we're thrilled to be turning those signatures in next week and moving into a litigation and a legal challenge season uh, for about a month and a half, and then shifting into our conversation around um, what our campaign looks like and our voter education efforts. So um, in terms of that's sort of our progress, we're really thrilled. We are uplifting a nonpartisan frame. We've been really impressed with how compelling the research and the polling is around ideologies and backgrounds. There is support for this across Republican, Democrat, and independent lenses. So while our frame is nonpartisan, we know that um, this is a really compelling mobilizing moment. Sarah mentioned that in her introduction. We have found that particularly with some of our communities that are feeling somewhat disaffected in this moment among Latinos in particular and among young voters in particular. Um, we are testing really um, effectively around how activating this issue is for our base. So obviously this is an important healthcare protection, an important right that we need to win now and into the future, but it's also really um, woven into the center of the fabric of this moment in Arizona in 2024. So that's a lot of responsibility. We're really proud to be moving in that space. We're really proud to be building community and coalition um, since I've joined the team, we've garnered 40 plus uh, endorsements from organizations across the spectrum from all different demographics and backgrounds, because we know that this issue touches everyone. Um, so my last point I'll just make is our campaign gaps and where we're at right now. We're so grateful to Movement Voter Pack for um, your support. Actually, since these numbers posted, we have made great progress. So we have closed our gap on qualification and signature gathering. So we are now looking at a $2 million gap for our litigation and our legal challenges and a $17.3 million gap for our campaign. So we're very excited to be reaching this threshold, very excited to be able to share that with all of you and um, would love to answer any questions or stay connected um, with you all and just really appreciate your support and the opportunity to share what we're doing in Arizona. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, 800,000 signatures, y'all. If any of you have ever done signature gathering, you know how many doors and events that means volunteers and staff have been to. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think you guys have already worked with over 6,000 volunteers to make that happen. Talk about base building and training a peaceful army. That is phenomenal work that is being done on the ground. So thank you so, so much. Um, and yeah, we, we really appreciate all of you who, uh, who can be supporting all of this work in Arizona right now. We are gonna jump to Montana right now, um, who has three layers of focus work they're doing in this space um, that Kirsten Iwai, one of my favorite Montanans with years of expertise working in digital comms, climate justice, youth organizing and diversity and inclusion spaces is gonna tell you about. She's another longtime friend of MVP who's been the fearless ED of Forward Montana since 2019 which is a firebrand organization that builds the power of young folks in Montana. And I believe that Kirsten was even an award-winning young volunteer of Forward Montana back in the day. So we're extremely happy to have her here with us today to tell us what's going on there. Hello, um, thank you so much. I am very excited to be here to talk to you about two things that are near and dear to my heart, reproductive rights in Montana. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So Forward Montana is a multi-entity organization that builds the civic and political power of young people so that Montana's politics and policies look a little bit more like us, compassionate, sustainable, and equitable. We serve high school and college students, non-college youth, young professionals, and youth in rural communities. I'm here to tell you about our work through Forward Montana, our C4, and Forward Montana Voter Fund, our PAC. Next slide, please. So we empower everyday folks to get involved and make their voices heard. That's from registering to vote, to running for office and everything in between. We meet young people where they're at, both on their phones and in real life. That could be on a campus move-in day before the start of the fall semester or at a brewery or coffee shop or at a river takeout during summer floats. And no one knows this better than Ella, one of our high school fellows in 2020. Ella reported that quote, I was given the resources to do independent community organizing with young voters in Butte. 
I've actually had multiple people ages 18 to 25 come up to me in the past few weeks and told me that they voted for the first time because of me. It's one thing to cast a ballot. It's a really important thing, actually. But it's another thing entirely to inspire people to get involved with Montana politics that could potentially last the rest of their lives, end quote. And this is our impact at Ford Montana. It's not just the big numbers, not just the turnout and the wins, but it's also about that individual development that'll last, last young people. But to win statewide, candidates must perform with young voters. This year, answer. we'll engage in a robust turnout and persuasion program to ensure young mm -hmm. Montanans understand what at stake, what no. candidates share no. their value, and how to cast their vote. This means targeted GOTV efforts that reach the right voters at the right time. This includes calls to young people across the state to identify pro-choice and anti-choice voters. And these voters will receive multiple contacts through a layered and strategic program. And in the fall, we will connect with young voters through phone calls, text, stores, mail, digital ads, and events. Nearly all of our GOTV efforts will feature our voter guides, a staple for every young Montanan. These voter guides will have an abortion-related question to make it clear which candidates stand with them and which ones don't. Next slide. And of course, we all know that the 2024 election is such a pivotal turning point on so many things. And of course, abortion access is at the top of that list. Young voters are highly motivated to vote on abortion. We know this because of conversations we have with young people when we're registering voters and knocking on their doors. This is also backed by a recent poll we did. Young people strongly favor abortion rights. Seven in 10 in Montana believe abortion should remain safe and legal, and the majority oppose limits to reproductive health care. They trust Democrats more than Republicans on the issue, but leaders need to show that they're fighting hard for what they believe in. So in Montana, abortion access and reproductive rights will show up in many ways on the ballot. The Senate race, two state Supreme Court seats, significant double digit pickup opportunities in the state legislature and an abortion ballot measure. Next slide. And while I'm gonna use this time to talk about the state Supreme Court and a constitutional initiative to protect about abortion access, of course, I have to mention a very important US Senate race, the reelection of Senator Tester. Senator Tester is a pro-choice champion, one who will fight for good judges and good legislation. He's actually evolved on the issue and he wasn't pro-choice when he was first elected into the state legislature over two years ago. But that's one of the best qualities of Senator Tester. He listens, and learns to best represent his constituents and what they need. And Montana is a special place because of our state constitution. If you don't know, it's probably one of the most progressive in the nation. It has ensured that our state Supreme Court can protect rights that have all been but erased in surrounding states, like the right to privacy and healthcare decisions, like abortion and gender affirming care, the right to a clean and healthful environment, and the right to participate in our democracy. Unfortunately, extremist politicians who would like to erode these rights are trying to take and undermine our state Supreme Court by threatening the independence of the court by passing policies, deter undermining the justices in the court of public opinion, and recruiting candidates for Supreme Court who would like the opportunity to reinterpret our state constitution or change it entirely. We currently have a slim majority of reliable pro-constitutions, a four to three majority. So in 2024, we have two seats up this year, um, including the Chief Justice seat. Both of these seats are held by pro-Constitution justices and it's imperative that we protect them. Neither are running for re-election, which means that we have new names to introduce to voters in these very low information races. We're most worried about protecting the Chief Justice seat. In the primary, the pro-Constitution candidate, Jeremiah Lynch, trailed the more conservative justice by 22,655 votes which is nine percentage points, not great, but there is hope um, because in the other seat, Justin Catherine Bittigray, uh, the, the uh, pro-constitution candidate, she beat her opponent, Dan Wilson, by 14 percentage points. So we know that voters want pro-constitution justice. We just really have a big opportunity and gap to fill. And our job is to connect Bittigray and Lynch to the things that we love most. But while we are so lucky to have good judicial precedent that has protected access to abortion in our state, the attacks from the opposition have only increased in the wake of the U.S. Supreme Court overturning Roe. Over a dozen anti-abortion bills were introduced during the 2023 legislative session alone, and many were signed into law and are now being challenged. We cannot exclusively play defense against attacks. We know that the majority of Montanans agree that abortion should be legal, 
and we want to give voters the opportunity to secure those rights. As an island of access in a region with virtually no other clinics, as Regina would also know, keeping Montana's abortion access is critical for healthcare. So Ford Montana is an executive member of Montana Securing Reproductive Rights, the ballot campaign to enshrine access to abortion in our state's constitution. Last week, we submitted over 117,000 signatures in support of CI 128, nearly double the number of signatures required to qualify for the November ballot. This is the most signatures ever submitted for a single ballot initiative in Montana's history, in a state with just over a million people and even less voters. So we're pretty dang proud. We submitted signatures from all 56 counties and all 100 house districts from Montana's largest communities to our smallest and counties in Montana, the populations can get pretty small. And this effort would not have been successful with over 500 trained volunteers of all ages and backgrounds who went above and beyond to collect signatures from their friends and neighbors. And next slide. So I want to thank MVP and Healthcare Leaders for Democracy for pulling all of us together. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Every day, I am so grateful that I am in a role where I get to be inspired by young people and in turn, inspire others. So I'll leave you all with this closing quote from one of our organizers. Um, this organizer traveled around the state last fall on what we call campus tour, going to all of the tiniest community, public, private, and tribal colleges in central and eastern Montana. And he said, I remember specifically having a conversation with a young man at Stonechild College on the Rocky Boy Reservation in Box Elder. He expressed the same apathy in voting as I have heard before. My vote doesn't matter. Politicians don't care. I feel like I don't know enough. I really express sympathy with that. Sometimes I'm paying attention to national politics, especially. It's easy to lose hope. But I reminded him of the same thing I remind myself when I get those feelings. Politicians, state houses, and other entities will only listen if your voice is audible. Now more than ever, it is important for young people to get out and get loud. If people aged 18 to 35 voted at the same rate as people 55 and over, youth would decide every election. Those words really resonated with him. He got himself registered right then and there. And I hope those words will continue with him when it feels like he's losing hope. So at Ford Montana, we believe in a Montana that believes in us. And we hope you do too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirsten. The work you all do in all corners of a very rural, very challenging state is so impressive. And the way you do it with deeply progressive values, including our most vulnerable folks in our communities and win is such a testament to what we can be accomplishing in red and purple states. And uh, most signatures ever submitted in Montana, this is power building people. This is why we do what we do. And uh, just a huge thank you to the Ford Montana team. Um, now turning to Florida. Florida's had some rough days, right? People can no longer access legal abortions beyond six weeks of pregnancy right now, but they are fighting back with an extremely bold ballot measure and one that is especially critical in the South, which is the biggest area of the US where pregnant people, especially pregnant people of color have the most restricted access already. And so Andrea Mercado, the executive director of Florida Rising is here to talk to us about Florida. Uh, Florida Rising, uh, her and her team lead scaled civic engagement programs and strategic campaigns that center black and brown communities. And she's also one of the co-founders of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, uh, where she served as organizing director, which I think many of our folks are familiar with and love. And she's led multiple national campaigns for immigrant and workers' rights and is another longtime friend and hero of MVP. So thank you so much for being here today, Andrea, both for, for Florida Rising and for the ballot measure today. Good evening, buenas noches. So good to be with the Movement Voter Project family. Uh, so um, honored uh, to be here with um, my sisters too from Montana and Arizona. Uh, so a little bit more about the organization that um, and the members that I have the honor of serving as our executive director. Uh, Florida Rising is a it's a membership based organization. So we're focused on black and brown communities in Florida. We have over 1500 dues paying members and members in every congressional district um, in the state who are fighting for justice on every block. Uh, just last night, I was with our members in Kissimmee. Uh, Puerto Rican um, neighborhood outside of Orlando uh, talking about Amendment 4, 
um, and the housing crisis um, and how we're um, coming together to uh, secure some victories in November. Um, so Florida Rising is a proud executive committee member of Amendment 4 here in Florida together with Planned Parenthood of Florida, ACLU of Florida, SCIU 1199, Voices of Florida, the Florida Women's Freedom Coalition, and the Florida Alliance. Um, and, you know, I think for us, it's, it's very clear that the overwhelming majority of Floridians think that we should all have the freedom to make our own personal health care decisions without government interference. And despite that, despite that, you know, we all know that that's common sense in the state. Um, politicians in Florida signed one of the most extreme abortion bans in the nation. Um, it's before most people even realize they're pregnant. I'm a mom of two. I didn't know I was pregnant at six weeks. Um, and, you know, we're, we've come together to put these decisions back in the hands of Florida families um, and their doctors. So um, Florida's long played a significant role in the abortion access landscape in the United States. Uh, it has consistently ranked as one of the top three providers of abortion care. Um, uh, there were 84,052 abortions provided in Florida last year. Um, and 9% come from surrounding states, right? Because um, abortion has um, been banned in many other surrounding states, people come to Florida um, and also come from other countries and territories. Um, and um, given Florida's size and its importance in the abortion access infrastructure, this loss of access that we're experiencing um, as of May 1st is when our abortion ban went into effect. Um, it's going to have wide and devastating effects. Our providers here in Florida, we estimate that within the first year, um, more than half of all patients' visits will be lost. And the number is going to continue to diminish over time. So just the kind of hardships that we're hearing of clinics um, closing due to their inability to provide the full spectrum of care. Um, we're also hearing of providers leaving the state due to fear of criminalization. Um, and um, we know that this extreme ban is it will increase maternal mortality rates. Um, it will increase the shortage of um, OBGYNs in the state. Um, and, um, and, you know, the research shows that new doctors are less likely to go to states with abortion bans. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think we're also sitting with the reality of like the impact that this ban has, um, not just on Florida, but on the nation um, and on um, patients across the global south. Um, people do come to Florida from the Caribbean and Latin America to get abortions um, in places where the procedure is not legal in their country. Um, because Florida may be the closest geographical location or a place where they have family. Um, and, you know, I think it's important though to, for us to like sit and recognize that um, that here in the US, while politicians are taking us backwards, abortion rights are actually advancing in Latin America. It's been legalized in three out of the four most populous countries. Um, we've seen the legalization and decriminalization of abortion in, Ar in Argentina, in, where my mom's from, in Colombia, um, in Panama, in Mexico. Uh, so, you know, I think we're taking a lot of inspiration in Florida from um, our sisters, um, from the Marea Verde and from across Latin America and the Caribbean. As with uh, every state that's hostile to abortion access, there are hurdles to qualification and passage. And um, our members and volunteers and team has just really gone above and beyond to overcome these hurdles in in phase one, um, we collected 1.2 million petitions um, to qualify and um, put this uh, amendment on the ballot. Uh, we collected over 250,000 petitions from volunteers, making it the largest volunteer petition collection effort in Florida and and in abortion ballot initiative history. Um, it was uh, a lot to get 250,000 volunteer petitions in. It was like an all hands on deck. It was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. 
Um, and then I'm also proud that like we've just innovated um, Black and Latino organizing and Black and Latino coalitions. Um, because when we win in November, we want to say that it was because of Black and Latina women and not in spite of. Um, and that's why it's really important to me that we have Florida Protegiendo a la Libertad, which is a, um, a coalition of over 20 um, Latino serving organizations in the state that comes together every two weeks that's doing the work in Spanish first that made sure that as soon as yesforflorida.com went live, um, floridalibertad.com went live. Um, and, you know, we're making sure that we're organizing in the communities that are most, will be most impacted by the extreme ban and have most at stake in overturning it. Because um, we know that it's communities of color um, and poor communities where um, patients won't have the ability to take days off work and afford a flight um, to New York or Chicago. Uh, we've received some really strong support from donors both in state and across the country who are invested in pr protecting freedom for Floridians and we continue to meet or exceed the 60% threshold across um, the metrics necessary to pass this amendment. 64% of Florida voters believe that abortion should be legal and nearly three quarters agree that we should limit government interference with abortion and that's the way that our ballot language is framed. Um, our campaign has to win at 60% because yes, it's Florida. It's not a simple majority. They make it even harder for us to pass these constitutional amendments, but we won the first $15 minimum wage in the South passing a 60% threshold. We won rights for returning citizens passing a 60% threshold. And, and we know that we can um, do the work that's required to, to get to 60%. Um, this campaign will be the largest reproductive rights ballot initiative with the with the largest patient impact in history. Um, it's a very large state, 21.8 million people, um, and uh, we anticipate a well-funded opposition. And so voter communication costs are really substantial. Um, so we have a large budget for the campaign. It's a $98.5 million budget, um, but as of Friday, We've brought in $19.6 million um, with a $4.5 million in outstanding commitments, which means that we've raised $24.1 million since April 1st. Um, and our goal is to raise an additional $10.1 million by June 30th um, and in firm commitments. Um, and I think that's why really we're here tonight is just we know that it's going to take all of us. Um, in phase one, we raised 80% of the budget from Florida-based do donors, um, but we know it's going to take um, our Florida-based donors, people like my mom, who gave to this campaign, who was never given to a political campaign a day in her life, um, because she can't believe that her granddaughters won't have the same um, rights that her daughters did. Uh, so I'm um, so grateful to Movement Voter Project for, as always, stepping up to the plate um, really encourage folks to to give what you can, um, and uh, I'll I'll also drop our donation information in in the chat. And really grateful for for all of you and the ways that people are um, giving their time, their resources, and their energy to help make sure that we um, protect access to abortion. Thank you so much, Andrea. So yeah, Florida, not just one of the biggest states with one of the most restrictive abortion measures on the books, but also one that has to win ballot measures by 60% of the vote, because no one's trying to make democracy easy these days. But we've seen them do it, like Andrea said, with the work of returning citizens, and Florida Rising has been such a huge leader in that work. It's so exciting to hear that there are these 20 Latin organizations doing Spanish first work. These are the kind of things that will absolutely make or break us being able to pass past this in Florida. So thank you so much for all you're doing. Thank you so much to all of our fabulous leaders um, who have been on this call tonight and for the work that I'm sure you're doing after this call tonight. 
Um, we're going to turn now to another great leader, Henry Allen, who is a leader with MVP's Amazing Healthcare Leaders for Democracy. And over the past 60 years, he's been an educator, community organizer, union organizer, political activist, and ran a foundation focused on supporting social and economic justice grassroots organizing. And now he's organizing with us. And so I pass it to you, Henry. You're on mute. Better? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Now I can do my thing. Um, thank you, Regina. And thank you to all the really amazing, extraordinary leaders and organizers that are uh, making powerful, powerful moves across this country to restore, protect democracy, and restore and protect and advance women's uh, re reproductive freedom um, and democracy. So over the next four months, uh, we must consider what are the most effective and impactful ways that uh, we can win in November in all of these states and others? Uh, MVP, along with his partner, Healthcare Leaders for our Democracy, know that supporting all of the grassroots organizations that we've heard from tonight and in every other state that MVP is supporting similar kinds of organizations, that these are the organizations that can really make a significant difference come November. Why? Well, as we've heard, because they have intimate knowledge and the trust of the communities where they live and work. So when they canvass, when they knock on doors, when they greet people in street corners, when they meet people anywhere they are gathered, these folks are trusted messengers. When you combine these qualities with their passion and commitment and energy, uh, they cannot be matched in terms of voter registration, voter education, voter turnout, and electing candidates who will indeed protect our democracy and reproductive freedom and justice. Uh, we know in addition, as uh, has been said tonight, that uh, there are supremely talented in turning out young voters and voters of color. So what is needed now? We know that these organizations are doing fantastic work, but they also need substantial additional resources to make an even greater impact in November. Many <clears throat> of them are already donors, uh, both to these organizations directly, which we encourage you to continue to do, as well as to Movement Voter PAC. Um, we know that um, you have been very generous, and these organizations are obviously very grateful for your support. But over the next four months, we have an opportunity and indeed an obligation to contribute to the ongoing success of these organizations at the grassroots level in their leaders and organizers and volunteers. And I would stress that these people, in many instances, especially the volunteers, are really ordinary people doing extraordinary things. So in addition to what has been raised already, and Healthcare Leaders for Democracy is a small piece of what's going on, but still, as Lillian, my colleague and friend has said earlier, uh, we've helped raise $450,000 over the past year uh, for MVP and these grassroots organizations, but we must do more. Our goal this evening, at least for Healthcare Leaders for Democracy and MVP, is to raise an additional $200,000. Towards that goal, we have received an extraordinary generous gift of $50,000 towards that $200,000 goal. But that must be matched dollar for dollar. And now is the time, we believe, for all of us to step forward, to be as generous as possible to the organizations you have been uplifted tonight by, to MVP and to Healthcare Leaders for Democracy. And so small gifts, large gifts, major gifts, whatever you're able to do, stretch your generosity to the limits. Now is the time to meet our goals um, and to meet that match. And we thank you for whatever you're able to do tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henry and Healthcare Leaders for Democracy. Um, 
you know, we're only able to highlight three of the amazing organizations and ballot measures tonight. But as you know, MVP is supporting dozens of groups working on the ground for reproductive justice and freedom this election cycle. So we encourage you give directly to these groups you've heard from tonight that you, this work is phenomenal. The amount of power building you just heard talk about um, in the other numbers that are represented through signatures and uh, through amount of volunteers, this is how we build and move forward even stronger than we are right now. And so give to the groups you heard tonight and also give to MVP for the other groups throughout the country from North Carolina to New Hampshire um, to all of the other states that Sarah went through earlier tonight. Um, to, for us to be able to fully fund these fights. These are expensive. Um, whether whether it's uh, Florida, Arizona, or Montana, these take a lot of dollars. Um, and we really, really appreciate everyone chipping in to do what you can to help make sure these leaders and organizers on the ground don't have to wait till the last month to do the work. Early money makes such a huge difference. And we're, we're still early, but just barely. So the more you can give now for these groups to be doing the, the continuous building work they need. And as you've seen, these aren't easy fights. There's signature gathering, there's litigation sessions, then there's all the GOTV and voter mobilization. And so now is absolutely the time, as, as Henry said. And um, we're so thankful for all of our presenters tonight and for all of that you have joined us tonight. And um, we are going to turn now to take questions. So floor is open. It's totally okay if you're too busy donating to ask questions right now. We get that. Um, can I, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So this is great. I definitely, I'm new to this. I love it. I'm going to donate some money. I, these, these, did, these donations are not tax deductible. I actually had a question about donating to plan the Planned Parenthood of Montana or Planned Parent of Arizona. Those kind of deductions are also ta are tax deductible. Are those worthwhile donations to make as well? All donations are worthwhile to make <laughs> for any of the <laughs> organizations that you just mentioned. This tonight is a PAC event, which means it's a political partisan event. So if you have specific questions about giving in other ways, um, at least through MVP, you can email advisor at movement.vote. Um, and um, yes, we encourage folks to, to resource the entire ecosystem. What we're trying to do a little bit here is lift up some of the groups in these reproductive justice and freedom ecosystems that aren't as well known and that don't always get the same level of funding. But like you said, Planned Parenthood is an ongoing phenomenal ally who is part of all these uh, ballot committees and coalitions you've heard about tonight. Great. Thank you. I, I love what you're doing and I'll definitely be donating. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, hi, uh, this is Mark. I'm in Vermont. Um, I'm wondering if anybody has already done. I know, I know one of you are in New Hampshire. Um, <clears throat> um, being kind of flagged as in danger. It wasn't 22 as well and the one in northern Maine as well. So those both two could be very determinative in a very easy overlooked uh, rural states. Um, I don't know I, I don't know if anybody has an insight into whether those the New Hampshire seat is actually endangered or is it just being called endangered? Uh, if nobody knows, that's fine. But hello and thank you for the evening as well. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. Um, Sarah, any thoughts? Yeah, happy to answer that. Yeah. So the main district that you mentioned is on our list of the 24 that I had said earlier of those toss-up seats. Um, the New Hampshire districts, for those of you who might not be aware, um, New Hampshire has a whopping two U.S. House districts, um, but yet they are never sure bets. Um, we're watching in particular CD2, um, where the longtime U.S. Representative um, Annie Custer announced that she is retiring. Um, there is an open primary on the Democrat and Republican side. The fun part about New Hampshire is that the, the and I say fun in quotes, um, is that the primary isn't until mid-September. Um, so we are watching that pretty heavily. I actually just had a conversation with a New Hampshire partner today about their efforts to engage voters in CD2 as well. 
Thank you. And your New Hampshire partners would be on your website. Um, most of their partners are, I noticed. So that's correct. Yep. And we're always happy to connect them directly as well. Great. Well, I'm in southeastern Vermont and our seat is Rebecca's relatively safe. And so if I want to direct local people to where the necessary work is, I can hook them up with your partners. That would be great, including myself. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can always email advisor at, and we'll do our best to, to make all the connections we can. Diane. Uh, yes. I'm. You may have said this, but it wasn't clear to me. How will money be that we donate to MVP be shared with the organizations that reported tonight? Sure. Yeah. So it will be um, MVP is, you know, with our state advisors on the ground, like Sarah is just able to give you very specifics about New Hampshire. You know, we have state advisors in almost all of our top priority states, as well as state advisors who are working in their regions. And so they are constantly taking the pulse of what the needs are, um, what the specific gaps are, and how re we can uh, delegate resources most um most kind of efficiently for the moment and the political moment. And so we are working with groups in North Carolina, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Nevada, who you didn't hear from tonight. And so whatever is raised from this evening will be divided up between the groups based on kind of need um, and timing. Um, yes. But what MVP tries to do is not just, not just fund, um, you know, our, our favorite groups, because they're all all our favorite groups will fund the entire ecosystem of groups that are making this happen and work in states. Um, and so tonight's will all go to groups specifically working on reproductive justice and freedom yeah. issues. Thank um, you. That was my within question. Those uh, ecosystems. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I see a hand. Uh, yes, Kate Stevens. Hi, I thought I just heard someone say, so far we've raised $450,000. I don't know what they were referring to because I know MVP has raised a lot more than that. So I, I, I missed something. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, um, good fact checking. Yes, MVP has raised a lot more than that. This is specifically what our phenomenal Healthcare Leaders for Democracy group has raised specifically for healthcare and reproductive justice and freedom organizations um, with their own volunteer efforts. That's in addition to all the, the money MVP is moving to groups on the ground. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. You want to donate tonight? Uh, yes. <laughs> Jake and Ed, I think we're we're hearing you a little bit. Oh hi! hi. <laughs> I, just, I just I was looking for the link to be able to donate. Oh yeah, so, we can put that in the chat again right now. I, so I just I, that's where I am right now is the to, at the Act Blue site, and it was I found the address in the chat. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, you can find the Act Blue uh, link in the chat. Um, and you can e email advisor at movement.vote um, for gifts over 5,000. We encourage you to email us directly. Um, and we appreciate all gifts of all sizes. So thank you so, so much for all you are doing so that we can have more organizers at the door at events and talking to all the voters necessary between now and November. And with that, we are at time. And so I hope all of you have a good rest of your evening. And um, yeah, we're not going to take it anymore. So let's keep fighting together. Appreciate you. Good night. Good night.